Hi, I'm Bob Gimelin. I rarely start a video with channel news, but I suppose I have some today. My illustrator, Fred Dunn, is currently working on a massive undertaking, and it is one of the most requested videos, and it's a beastly undertaking. And I'm super excited about it, but I'm hesitant to even bring it up because it'll still be a few months before this gigantic project is completed. But I mention it because you may have noticed that there was no video last month, and I just want to make it abundantly clear that just because I haven't uploaded anything does not mean that I haven't been hard at work. A lot more goes into these than it may seem. And trust me, the breaks bum me out too. I too have channels that I eagerly await, so I really do appreciate the enthusiasm. But please know that from the very beginning of this channel, there has not been a single day where I haven't worked on it in some way. Even the day I got my wisdom teeth ripped out of my mouth. So from now until that project is done, I'm going to make do with what I already have on the table, because Fred is most occupied. This video is kind of meh, but I'm working on two longer ones in addition to the big project, and those videos are pretty neat, and I'll be uploading them in the coming weeks. Anyway, Christmas before the plague, I visited the zoo, and I took pictures of hominids. I think they were at least 30 feet away, and these were 60 feet away. It's funny, people on my channel squabble over Imperial versus Metric, and I'm here using school buses. That's my preferred metric. So, 25 feet, or 7.5 meters. Anyway, some were one school bus away, and some were two. And I just couldn't get compelling photographic proof of the darn things. <laughs> now these sentient primates are accustomed to being ogled at by walk-by gawkers. They were making no attempt to conceal themselves. And the pictures were taken with an iPhone X. Not mine. The 12 megapixel camera exhibits such features as auto image stabilization, autofocus with focus pixels, optical image stabilization, true tone flash, panorama, auto HDR, exposure control, five element lens, five times digital zoom, which sometimes I used, high dynamic range, sapphire crystal lens cover, face detection, and more. The lighting was manufactured to perfection, and there was no obstruction, and I had the high ground. So I don't know. But if an image of this quality came from the American woods, and add movement and obstruction, and lighting variation, perhaps the shimmer of leaves, and perhaps a quiver from the camera holder, as I might expect. Not to mention that the thing you're filming is trying very hard to not have something aimed at it. What do you think people would say about these? Even my cat is drawn to cover and concealment when there's no need for it. And this is just an example of how amazing these cameras are at point blank. But I have a suspicion that if you're ever this close, your odds of ever posting or sending such an image are pretty slim. If you're that close, I can't imagine a scenario where that would ever be the case in the field of not paleoanthropology. And guess whose task it is to recover said device. As far as the history of cameras is concerned, these images were captured by the top percentile, without question. But the difficulty of taking any convincing photos isn't even really relevant to me, because by the nature of the creature's existence, it's capable of perceiving you long before you level your piece. You could say I believe in Bigfoot, under the condition that it is incomprehensibly aware and reactive to its environment. Because, you know, that's a trait that no fossil could indicate, and a trait that may be indicative to no fossils being found. I think that if such a creature exists, then we are merely toddlers in comparison to their perception of the natural world. And I think people overthink this. It's not necessarily supernatural or even beyond the scope of what is reasonable to biology. Think about how we walk through the woods. The slam of a car door. Or a good throat clear. Or a broken spider web where one wasn't previously. What if any number of these things present to them like red flags or police sirens do to us? I don't know. I feel like that changes the odds a bit. I made a video about how great apes respond to new stimuli, such as game cameras. And though the known great apes respond to new stimuli differently, they have one thing in common. All the great apes notice them. And that video reminded me of a very specific memory I have from college. So I had a roommate who was totally OCD. Or at least, he had OCD tendencies. I personally am not particular about such things, so I was always mildly intrigued by watching such a display of orderliness. And there was no greater example of his particularity than the mini-fridge we shared. I recall it well, because I found the consistency remarkably amusing. The bottom shelf of the fridge was just wide enough to allow for two rows of cans to sit edge to edge. Per my roommate's compulsion, the cans of Miller High Life, I believe they were, were always placed in a row of two, regardless of whether there were two cans or eight. 
The rows always began opposite the hinge side. If it was an odd number, the odd can was always pushed to the back, closest to the hinge side. And that would always be the first can selected for drinking. And I certainly noticed that the odd can out was basically the red shirt of beverages. It never lasted long, because I think my roommate couldn't tolerate the oddness. Not that many college students require any reason to enable alcoholism. It was a Tuesday morning, and I had just gotten back from a run. Normally, we kept the door locked, but my roommate correctly assumed that I did not bring my keys with me on my run, so the door was left open, though he was gone. I went to the mini-fridge to grab a bottle of water, and when I opened the door, I immediately knew that someone had been in the fridge. My roommate's system was broken. An intruder had brought disorder to the chilly ecosystem. The cans of High Life on the bottom row were kind of offset. Now I knew they were always a particular way, so the only conclusion I was left with was that someone had taken a can and then jostled them together in an apparent attempt to make the missing one less obvious. I guzzled down a bottle of Ice Mountain, and then helped myself to the wild turkey that sat in the door, the only place it could comfortably fit. It was college after all, and drinking at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday seemed like a totally reasonable thing to do at the time. This was before I got my life in order, or attempted to anyway. There was a mystery afoot, after all. The first question I had was what kind of scumbag would be drinking at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. Well, believe it or not, that actually narrowed the list of suspects down considerably. Sipping my sticky glass, the next question I pondered was, who would take a high life, and why? There were also bottles of Rolling Rock, and of course my roommate's precious and disgusting Guinness. We fought a whole damn war so we could stop pretending to like that stuff. At least I think that's what that was about. Whoever the beer thief was, he obviously didn't owe me or my roommate anything, which was kind of rare, because we had plenty of friends who would have been more than justified in taking a Rolling Rock or a Guinness. So I deduced that it was someone who contributed nothing to the illicit college ecosystem, or else they surely would have taken something that wasn't gross. I ruled out that the beer thief took a high life to be considerate, because if that was the case, he wouldn't have covered his tracks. And I found the jostling interesting. This perpetrator was self-conscious, maybe because it was so early, or maybe just generally speaking. He didn't want us to know that he had taken a beer, even though we didn't know who he was. So he was concealing his actions, even though his action was anonymous. He had inarticulately attempted to cover his tracks, and in doing so, made his treachery far more apparent, because I definitely would not have noticed anything amiss if he had simply taken a can and then not skewed the rest. Nothing of value was taken from the dorm. There was a change jar and a couple laptops. Therefore, I ascertained that the suspect had no interest in malice or profit. No doubt, he just wanted to ease the burden of life for a spell. Because the fact of the matter is, my roommate or myself would have gladly given a beer away, and we certainly wouldn't have been mad that one was taken. I considered all the factors, and I had a pretty good idea of the identity of the perpetrator. In fact, I would have bet money on it. Then I took a shower because I was sweaty, and on my way back to the room, by chance, I locked eyes with the fiend himself, who was probably scoping out another mark to hit. At first, I could tell he was just going to greet me, but then he saw my face, and then no doubt, he recalled that I'm borderline psychotic, and before I even said a word, he ran away shouting, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And as punishment for his deception, he had to listen to no less than 60 minutes of Bigfoot talk. Those are the rules. Beverage thievery has consequences. By the way, this is why I wasn't a great student. No, not the drinking, but because the mystery of the pointless thing that happened was far more intriguing to me than the past two semesters of learning combined. Anyway, why on earth did I tell you all of this? I'm trying to impress upon you the amount of data that the human brain can ascertain from even the most minute detail. Mind you, I didn't even notice that a can was missing. I noticed that the cans were slightly offset, misplaced by mere inches. I knew the normal creature of my habitat would never do that, meaning someone else did. And it took me all of ten seconds to solidify a hypothesis beyond a reasonable doubt, a hypothesis that turned out to be correct. Mind you, I'm not saying this is a skill unique to me. In fact, quite the contrary. I've never considered myself particularly clever, especially in comparison to particularly clever people, though I do consider myself to be reasonably clever among people who are not very clever. You could say that this ability to interpret data from our surroundings is uniquely human, but you'd be wrong. 
and no one can even begin to assess how that skill would play out to a creature with a brain function that is equal to or greater than our own. Perhaps a creature whose whole world is a compulsively organized mini-fridge. A creature that puts all of its brain function not to opening cans or driving or Skyrim, but to understanding the order of its setting, and understand exactly how to effectively respond whenever disorder is introduced. Tracking is nothing more than looking for that which is out of place. Imagine something that has an intrinsic understanding of everything's place. Something that instead of reading a book, simply looks around. Because the action of reading a book is really pretty remarkable. You literally just stare at squiggles for hours and hours, and wildly hallucinate the whole time. All the while considering thousands and thousands of potential outcomes. Imagine all that brain function going to something more practical but perhaps with the same level of entertainment. And this is one of my many videos that I always struggle to believe that anyone actually made it to the end. But I really wanted to come up with a way to illustrate just how good we are at not only noticing minute details, but then extrapolating that information into a pretty solid hypothesis. We do it all the time. You could even call it second nature. We usually don't even think about it. Maybe the TV wasn't on the channel you left it on, or the pillow on the couch was moved or that paperclip you'd been saving is gone. We don't really notice these tiny little details in the woods. Imagine something that does. Then imagine, if you will, that the brain function behind the forest-bound observer just may be on par with our own. I know that sounds like a stretch, but what if it isn't? Like I said in the beginning, because my illustrator Fred Dunn is muy occupado with a monstrous storyboard, I have to make do with what I already have on the table. And this video was a concept that I had made up a while ago, but then decided not to use because it turned out kind of weird and more protracted than I intended it to be. And that's a challenge with any creative output. Sometimes the final product is hard to visualize until it's actually completed. But like I said, I'm working on a huge project and I don't want to leave you all hanging in the interim. But the key takeaways are, if an image of this caliber came out of a North American forest, people would say it's just a dark spot. Why didn't he zoom in? Okay, so then let's zoom in. Then someone would say, of course it's fuzzy. Maybe big feet are actually fuzzy. L-O-L-O-L-O-L-O-L. Or look at this. Someone would say, well, this is obviously a puppet. Except it isn't. And I also think it's worth mentioning that the smooth, featureless, and non-reflective background helped these images tremendously. Add blades of grass, leaves, shadows, and shade, or snow, and they'd be near indecipherable. And of course, all of those elements absolutely pale in comparison to the overwhelming factor that you're talking about a creature that is obviously very good at not being sighted, much less filmed. Because seriously, look at this image, at maybe 50 feet, with limited obstruction and a smooth background. An image like this is theoretically as ideal as anyone could hope for in terms of taking a picture of a Bigfoot in the field. And if this was a Bigfoot, it would prove absolutely nothing. I mean... Just look how the infant moves here. That just seems so squatchy to me. Pardon my French. And I just can't impress upon you enough how close I was, between 20 and 60 feet, with stationary subjects. In an environment that's literally engineered for clarity. And it's just not very impressive at all. If I took an image like this from an African jungle, it would be considered reasonable that I snapped a picture of a gorilla. But because Bigfoot is not proven to exist, the same caliber of image would be dismissed. Which is only reasonable, since the burden of proof is on the advocate, but it certainly doesn't help with being taken seriously. So when skeptics say, everyone has cell phones, everyone has cameras, I mean, I'm not very impressed. If I had a photo of what I believe to be a Bigfoot, of this clarity, I'd be pretty hesitant to show it off. Well, I should clarify, I wouldn't be hesitant because I'm a crazy Bigfoot person, but if I was a normal person, I wouldn't expect anyone to give it a second thought, even if what I had captured on camera had been clear and definitive to my own two eyes. And as for my menial dorm story, I only went into that to represent an example of the power of the human brain. Again, I'm no Sherlock Holmes. Even a perfectly average mind, such as my own, is incomprehensibly and inexpressibly competent at understanding systems that are so complex that you don't even realize it's a system until you notice an aberration. And this entire thought process that occurred in maybe 90 seconds was literally just an average human dealing with a daily happening. Imagine something not average. Something beyond human, dealing with something that is instrumental to its very survival. 
Whenever I hear someone say, there's no way they could stay hidden, I just have to disagree. Well first, what exactly do you mean by hidden? Because it's not like they're all that hidden. I think the majority of people in North America and Europe, and I'd even hazard to say the world, would have a pretty good idea of what this is if it walked in front of their car. So it can't be all that hidden, if it is in fact universally identifiable. And as for finding one, finding it I don't think is the hard part, though I'm sure it's certainly not easy. Or perhaps more accurately, allowing it to find you. But I just don't know what you do from there. I honestly don't think it's horribly far-fetched to conceive of something that, simply put, really knows what it's doing. And if you see one, it's not like, oh, okay, case closed. You have to prove it. And I think people radically overestimate their ability to do just that. I don't know. I just think Bigfoot would be taken a lot more seriously if we truly considered what humans are capable of, and then considered what something beyond us may be capable of. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I have a couple more videos coming in the next few weeks, and then a big project that I think will be a real crowd pleaser. Anyway again, and as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.